thanks for being here. Um, so the research <coughs> that I'm presenting today is uh, actually part of a, of a project um, that is called Invaluable. And uh, that was funded by uh, several uh, European uh, research agencies. Um, as a presentation is going to, to, to last for about 10 minutes, uh, information will be limited, but you will have access to more um, on the publications. All of these has been published already. The Invaluable project is um, about market-based instruments for ecosystem services and, and biodiversity. The fact is <clears throat> that there's been a heavy trend uh, about since the 90s uh, towards these MBIs, MBIs for market-based instruments uh, for ecosystem services. And um, that was even amplified in the 2000s <clears throat> because of the spectacular emergence of, of the concept of ecosystem services <clears throat> that became a priority in terms of policies, but also in terms of, of research. <clears throat> the fact is that these MBIs were presented as innovative policy instruments, especially as compared to previous approaches, <clears throat> such as more common and control um, uh, policy instruments or approaches, and even ICDPs for integrated conservation and development projects. But we find that there are very few commonalities or very few similarities uh, among all of these uh, so-called uh, market-based instruments. So <clears throat> that triggers some confusion and uh, we argue that this confusion is um, a problem uh, for a number of reasons uh, that I don't really have time to elaborate but I will quote only two of these reasons. One is that it's an impediment to a proper evaluation of policies if we don't really know what we talk about, if we, do, we, we, can, we cannot really compare uh, between instruments and evaluations. And that opens the door to many ideology-driven uh, discourses and statements uh, about these market-based instruments. And that, in turn, <clears throat> has delayed a number of international processes and, and decisions, especially in the context of, of very uh, hot controversies about the commodification of nature. So the way we address this problem very briefly today is <clears throat> by uh, defining and proposing a number of categories with more homogeneous instruments in each of these categories in order to have a better understanding of what's an MBI. And if I have time, but I doubt I have time, uh, I will talk more about some empirical assessment uh, we did about some payments for ecosystem services experiments in Indonesia. So maybe I will have some questions about it in the future. Who knows? Um, so let, let me <coughs> present very briefly these six categories. So it's, it's kind of a typology of MBIs that we proposed <coughs> that was published. and. Uh, you may have different kinds of typologies, different, different ways to categorize instruments, but this one is very much based on the interactions, I mean, on, on how these policy instruments interact with markets, how they use the markets uh, to operate, and with what kinds of markets, with what characteristics. So a first category would be uh, direct markets, where the ecosystem goods and services are directly consumed uh, by the beneficiaries or by the users uh, in order to um, provide more value to the ecosystem and, 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 and to lead to its conservation. So here you can think of, as an illustration, you can think of uh, the trade in NTFPs, non-timber forest products, uh, for instance, or even nature tourism. A second category would be tradable permits. <clears throat> here you set a cap on the use of a given resource. Uh, so you artificially create scarcity for that resource. And then the resource users can exchange permits among themselves in order to reach the cap. So that's what we see with the carbon markets. And uh, in another field, that what we see with uh, the ITQs for uh, individual transferable quotas for fisheries. A third category would be <clears throat> what I call regulatory price changes, where a regulation is set that leads effectively to a change in the relative prices of goods and services depending on their attributes, depending on their impact on the environment, whether positive or negative. So here you can think as an illustration of, of eco-taxes and uh, more specifically uh, you can think of a carbon tax where you change the relat relative prices of, of, um, of gasoline, for instance. A fourth category would be voluntary price signals. Here, the producers of a given good or service try to send a signal to consumers saying, 
my good is better than the others in terms of impact on the environment, for instance, and in exchange you should give me a price premium, or I will strengthen my market share just because I tell you it's good. Um, and here you can think of the well-known FSC certification as an illustration. A fifth category would be what I call cohesion type agreements. Uh, so this is based on the co theorem, which is central to environmental economics dating from the 60s. And the co theorem says that whatever the initial allocation of rights, if the right holders can exchange the rights among themselves, and if the transaction costs, I mean pursuing their own interest, and if the transaction costs are very low, then you will reach an optimal situation. Uh, and here, that's that the, that's, that the theory um, that works for lots of PES, Payments for Ecosystem Services schemes, for instance. And I will just conclude with a, a fifth category, which is reverse auctions. So everybody knows about the principle of auctions. Here it's reversed. So instead of having buyers who compete among themselves, you have sellers who compete among themselves. And this is a way to, to get a, ma a maximum output with minimal resources spent. And as an illustration, I can just mention uh, the conservation resource program in the US where farmers can get payments for um, um, putting some of the land on fallow. So once these six categories are defined, <coughs> we, test, um, we test these, we see to what extent they're relevant with uh, um, a literature review with a sample, representative sample of um, about 100 references. We see how social scientists actually define and view uh, these MBIs. And what we find is that about a quarter of these um, articles do not really define uh, these MBIs, do not really f define the topic of research. And it's difficult to then put these instruments in one or the other category. Another quarter or another 25% of these articles deal with tradable permits, <coughs> which is a category we defined before. And the other categories are represented in the range of 6 to 12% of the articles. <coughs> so it, it's, it's much lower. So this is actually, <coughs> I find that actually not, not, not bad in the sense that the tradable permits as a category really meets many conditions uh, for economists uh, uh, to be understood and to be accepted as a market-based instrument in the sense that you have competition, you have many buyers and sellers, and you can expect an efficient allocation of, of the resources. What we find as well is that the analytical approaches that are used in all of these articles that deal with the MBIs are very diverse. They are diverse in terms of uh, method diverse in terms of scale, it can be local to national to global, and they're also diverse in terms of evaluation criteria. So whether you're interested in looking at the efficiency, at the effectiveness, at the equity, at the poverty alleviation, and many other evaluation criteria. So that in the end, <coughs> the overall um, statistic of about half and half of positive and negative assessments for these MBIs uh, the, the statistic is difficult to, to understand, it's difficult to interpret. So what can we say about the MBIs, whether they're good or bad, whether they uh, meet the expectations or not, is, is uh, still subject to discussion. So I presented these six categories. If we want to simplify further, <clears throat> we can even think of two big ensembles of, of uh, market-based instruments. And the distinction could be made between what I call market governance and what I would call bilateral governance. So you would have market or bilateral governance. A market governance would be using a real market with lots of exchanges, with standard goods that would be traded in order to reach an equilibrium price in an optimal situation. On the contrary, <coughs> by contrast, uh, a bilateral governance would refer to more bilateral uh, transaction, bilateral agreements, specific transactions for specific problems, uh, usually local, and involving a very limited number of actors, uh, 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 buyers or sellers, and whose nature, whose identity matters. You make a deal with someone because you know who, who this is, for instance, because he's got a, a specific or she's got a specific role to play. And that's important to make that broad distinction because <coughs> 
it's all about market-based instruments, at, uh, at least in the minds of many people, but the implications of being in one or the other category are extremely different. The risks, the opportunities are extremely different. If you deal with fluid markets, uh, market governance, you may have a risk of a commodification of nature, or of losing control, for instance. But you, don't have the you, you, you also have the opportunity to efficiently allocate your resources, for instance, and, and to have a better outcome. With bilateral governance, you have usually higher transaction costs. Uh, it's more difficult to implement. Uh, but you have something that may uh, be in a better position uh, to, to solve your problem uh, in a given context. So I will just <clears throat> maybe mention um, just to conclude, some of the conclusions from, some of the findings from uh, the study we did on two different sites where PES, Payments for Ecosystem Services, were implemented in Indonesia, one in the western part of, of Java and the other one in, on the island of Lombok. Uh, because PES are supposed to be a, a market-based instrument, it's, it's, it's defined as such uh, by, by many researchers and even policymakers. And what we find <coughs> is that even though the theory of signal is at the very heart of these payments for ecosystem services. In practice, uh, the signal is, is kind of lost in translation. As I would say, it's not very well transmitted uh, to the receivers who would make the decisions on the ground uh, based on these incentives that would be provided. And, um, and that's maybe a problem uh, in terms of, of market. Uh, because this is what we can expect from markets. You know, it's, it's, it's to guide decisions based, based on a number of signals. So if it doesn't operate in practice, uh, it may be an impediment um, to their effectiveness. And I think I will stop on this one. Thank you, Romain. I think uh, you've raised lots of uh, very important questions. Uh, and so I'd like to open up the floor to, uh, to comments or questions from colleagues. Jacob. Sorry. I, I'm hoping, Roman, you can elaborate a little bit more about these Indonesian examples and about, excuse me. I'm hoping that you can elaborate a little bit more about what you found from these Indonesian examples and, and the categories that they fall into, market or, or excuse me, yeah, market right. or, or bilateral. OK, yeah. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, <clears throat> there is an ambiguity, uh, I think, regarding the, um, the status of payments for ecosystem services. Actually, the connections to market-based instruments are are kind of ambiguous. I would myself not really consider uh, many of these experiments as, as market in the sense that you usually make in advance an economic valuation of the services and then you set, you, you, you make the agreements based on this. But when you have a market, I mean the market is supposed to, to, to lead you to these, to these prices. So, <clears throat> so just, just to tell you that uh, uh, in the first place, these experiments in Indonesia <clears throat> were about watershed services and they were, they were very prominent. So you have lots of talks, lots of, of discourses about um, the potential of these payments for ecosystem services to deal with, you know, to, to, to trigger conservation, uh, to contribute to poverty alleviation as well in many places where, you know, the sources of income are very limited. But what we see in practice with these two experiments is that it's very difficult and it takes so much time to take off. Uh, it takes too much, too, so much time to be implemented at scale, and sometimes it, it's never, it's even never implemented at scale. One reason why it is so <coughs> is that the transaction costs are, are extremely high, and so it's usually heavily subsidized. You have a number of donors, you have development agencies that push for the design and implementation of this, but you know it's, it's difficult. Uh, one reason is, as I say, it's, it, that the signal itself is, is, is difficult to, to transmit. And, 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 and one reason for that is that you have lots of institutional layers. Um, you have lots of uh, governance layers, I would say. In the case of uh, Chidanao in West Java, you've got, you've got the donors, you've got a company, actually, who pays for, that pays for it. And then you've got a multi-stakeholder agency that is supposed to represent a number of stakeholders, NGOs, forest agencies, and so on. And then you have farmer groups. And then in the end, you have the landowners who make decisions. 
So I mean, the signal is 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 kind of blurred. It's it, is it, it, not well understood because of this long process. And another problem is <coughs> that the multi-stakeholder agency <coughs> that is supposed to represent all of these usually is dominated by one local, very influential player. So in the case of Chidanao, it was a local NGO <coughs> trying to uh, um, uh, um, uh, pursue um, its own development agenda. In the case of Lombok, it was a, a local forest agency that saw here an opportunity for um, getting more financial resources to, to, to promote sustainable forest management. That might not be a bad thing in itself, but then the, the, the issue of ecosystem services is kind of uh, forgotten in the process. So it might not lead you know, eventually to a, a proper and efficient uh, provision of ecosystem services. And this is kind of unavoidable, uh, as, as, as we saw, actually. Christoph. Uh, I have a more general question. Um, <clears throat> So, like, if you if we look over, over the let's say over the last several years, uh, maybe a decade or so, uh, it seems that there's, there's there's been a lot of sort of re, you know reliance on on these market-based mechanisms to you know to, to you know for, for, for sustainability and for there was a, there's a, there was a lot of hope associated with that, mm -hmm. and then the last few years you i don't know at least in my opinion you see kind of like a reaction uh, on the part of the governments in certain countries like indonesia that okay these market based mechanisms you know they, they they were promising but they didn't really pan out in many ways so there is, seems to be some kind of tendency to uh, maybe i don't know go back to these kind of bilateral or, or, or government 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 based uh, arrangements or schemes and so on um, what is your opinion on that? Do, do you really, do you actually, you know, do you see this kind of tendency in the, in mm -hmm. the market for pests? Yeah. Oh, and and what, 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 you know, are they the, the real reasons for this? Or maybe there's something else? I think there's been, uh, there's been very high expectations and uh, some sort of fantasy uh, on behalf of economists. <laughs> you know, and what happens in the minds, I mean, some people say what happens in the minds of economists when they sit at a desk is very different from what's going to happen on the ground once these policies are designed and implemented. And this is exactly what we, I think, witnessed, what we saw. Uh, these instruments faced, I would say, they faced the principle of reality and uh, they faced very great inertia, um, high transaction costs, uh, misunderstandings, uh, and so on and so forth. There are many reasons um, <clears throat> that I won't elaborate right now, but the fact is, I mean, I would summarize all of these problems with facing the principle of reality. Uh, you can look at the carbon markets, for instance. That, that's <clears throat> something that everybody knows in this room. And uh, you can think also of uh, biodiversity offsets. So this is more about biodiversity and ecosystem services, biodiversity offsets. It's supposed to be a market mechanism. In fact, in the end, it's all about making deals between project developers and, and those who would provide the offsets uh, for very specific situations. And it's very time consuming, it's very resource consuming, so that in the end it cannot be qualified as a market, even though it was supposed to be so, and that, that's how it was conceived. Uh, we studied the case in France, for instance, where, I mean, it's very complicated, it doesn't really happen, it's very few transactions. The whole thing about the market is that you would have lots of transactions, uh, you know, to reach uh, the optimal situation. If you have, if you, if you don't have the fluid, uh, of fluid exchanges, and, and many buyers and, and sellers, it doesn't really make sense anymore. So that in the end, people tend to mistake uh, uh, payment schemes or simple incentive schemes for market-based instruments. Uh, I would argue it's it's not really the case. So the, the PES experiments you were mentioning are usually more alike. Um, uh, subsidy programs and that's for instance the case of Costa Rica which is like the emblematic uh, payment for ecosystem services it's a, it's a subsidy program I would argue uh, it's about the state I mean the, 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 the money is collected through you know taxes paid by the hydrocarbon industry 
which has nothing to do with the services provided on these lands where you would have sustainable forest management and so this is managed by a fund that provides incentives to land owners to do either conservation, sustainable forest management, uh, reforestation or whatever. So I mean the innovation here can be challenged uh, I would say. Peter. Thanks. I think, so I think this topic is really at the core of what we are working on, so it's really interesting to hear, listen to the discussion. And, and the way I read it is not really about uh, market versus non-market, it's more to understand how the whole mix of, of uh, decision making is operating. And so you said lost in translation, it seems more to be lost in transaction. So it's really one, one of the efficiency dimensions is the, is the transaction cost. And the other dimension that I would like to ask you more, also more about is, that even if it was a zero cost transaction, how much of the decision making does, it, does the uh, scheme or payment system actually influence on the ground? Is that something you're planning to research more about? Um, in the sense that there is the economic dimension, but there might also be other dimensions for, of, the of the decision making on the ground that is not strictly uh, economic or at least not neoclassical economics. Indeed. <clears throat> yeah, so I will just remember the last transaction. Uh, thanks for it. It's, it's, it's indeed, it, it summarizes uh, one of the problems. Uh, in, in terms of uh, decisions, I mean, I think that now many people understand that so many decisions are not made strictly uh, for financial reasons, indeed. And uh, so that's one of the limitations as well, <clears throat> I would say, to uh, the effectiveness of, of many of these approaches. <clears throat> and actually there is a, an emerging uh, a thinking of corpus uh, that looks as, it's related to what you say, uh, that looks at um, the motivation crowding out effect. That means, it's kind of a barbarian term, that means that people would forget about their intrinsic motivations once they can get incentives, once they can get rewarded. Um, for conservation uh, with financial payments. So there would be a motivation crawling out in the sense that they would not do conservation anymore for social reasons but just for financial reasons. And so here we see that there could be a shift in how people would make decisions indeed and they could be kind of perverted uh, by uh, the uh, implementation of these schemes. I, I personally don't really think this is a case uh, and I actually think the risk is very limited just because the level of implementation, the scale of implementation is extremely limited itself. So that's why I also uh, challenge usually people who, <coughs> who, who talk about the commodification of nature which is kind of, I think it's more in their minds than, than in practice. So in terms of decisions, yeah, in, in, indeed it's, it's, not a, it's not all about you know, um, financial calculations and, and there are many other ways to influence um, how people make decisions. If you look at certification, uh, you may have certified products, but in the end the prices are quite the same with the other ones. You know, and actually I had a discussion also with, with Steve about maybe novel approaches uh, to, to guide uh, a virtuous, um, to, to lead to virtuous decisions that would not be based on, on these grounds actually. And it's like consumers would take responsibility uh, by themselves uh, to lead to positive outcomes uh, without, ha without having these, all of these policies uh, in place. I'm not sure uh, the, yeah. Thank you, Romain. Do we, I think we have time for one more question or comment? Uh, then I'll so step in and offer a comment. And with respect to uh, just your reflections perhaps on the role of institutions uh, at the local level in all of this. And there seems to be one of the issues that you've identified is that the instruments, the signals coming from these market-based instruments are not getting through. And I'm wondering if, you know, what the scope is for further sort of understanding about what's inhibiting those signals reaching local producers. And, and, and one would imagine that local institutions are key in this. And I wonder if, you know, if they're always, if you will, those institutions are, are fit for purpose, that is fit for receiving and disseminating those kinds of 
those kinds of uh, uh, signals, at least in the context of some of the cases we've looked at. And I wanted to put in the mix the example of ejidos in Mexico, where you have these sort of collective institutions that are quite old, if you will, in relative terms to, you know, the notion being that it takes time for institutions to find their feet, to develop their kind of credibility, to work out procedures. But, you know, the ejidos in Mexico have been very successful vehicles for payment for environmental services schemes with respect to water conservation and tree planting in, in, uh, in the uplands. It's had huge national benefit. And I'm wondering if some of the cases we've looked at might not have had the same kind of experience or maturity with respect to engaging with transfers and market signals in the ways that, say, the Mexican case has, right. and if that makes a difference. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think there is maybe a dilemma, uh, a, a dilemma here, because you would have the temptation to, to go straight to the decision makers, indeed. Uh, but at the same time, you have all of these, you know, local dynamics, social dynamics that are difficult to, you know, uh, bypass, of course, and it's maybe not even a good thing. So you mentioned the case of Ejidos in, uh, in, in Mexico. Um, in the case of Indonesia, indeed, I think it would be a bad idea anyway to, to try to bypass all of these uh, local institutions uh, such as farmer groups, even though in the shorter term, uh, it poses a number of problems just because the signals are difficult to, to be transmitted uh, effectively uh, to the decision makers and you have lots of, uh, you know, lo local manipulations, uh, but even not intentional sometimes, you have lots of, lots of problems to deal with. So I think that you may expect, actually I think we should, we should keep going that way, uh, just to try to answer your question, and you, we may expect uh, the positive outcomes uh, in the longer term. Because I, I emphasized the fact that the signal was, was not perfect. Uh, this is from the perspective of these uh, PES, right? Uh, uh, payments for Ecosystem Services. But in terms of, of longer term impacts and with slightly different approaches as this is in practice, it might not be a problem and it, it might even be better. So these you know, the, the, these people will make decisions, not necessarily on financial grounds, but it might not be even a problem because we also observed that there was um, a, a, a higher level of, of understanding and of awareness by these people about the environmental issues, which is kind of in, in, indirect and unexpected consequence of having these uh, uh, experiments on the ground, and which is actually, which actually contradicts the negative effect of motivation calling out in the fact that people would be obsessed by uh, the financial returns of making one or the other decision. Actually, it's not exactly what we observe. We observe something different. People pay attention to the environment in many cases just because there's been all of these meetings, you know, and there are kinds of incentives as well. So I think this is actually the, the, the way forward. Maybe a last, <clears throat> a last comment would be, that many of these schemes are based on, 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 on the notion of, of, of voluntary payments. It's like the service beneficiaries would, would pay for it, you know, uh, not relying on the state, uh, for instance. Um, but in practice, it, it's difficult because of, you know, you have public goods, you want your neighbor to pay for you, and you have many problems, the transaction costs are high, and so on. So actually what we find is that it's better to rely on mandatory ways to, to do resource collection, like establishing a tax. And then the way you spend the money can be through bilateral agreements with these people. So actually these instruments are usually multidimensional. So you've got different instruments in one single mechanism, for instance. How you collect the money, how you spend it, how you set the price. You could, have, uh, you could use reverse auctions in order to set the price. Um, in order to set the level of payments, uh, for instance, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. Romain, thank you very much.